theory of social development worth its salt must possess a coherent understanding of the relationship between humanity and non-human nature, as well as how this relationship is changed by different forms of socio-economic organisation. The present capitalist mass extinction makes this clear beyond doubt. Despite the importance of this, many introductory approaches to Marxism leave Marx and Marxism's view of nature by the wayside, or else confine themselves to merely stating that capital's hunt for profit leaves it unable to build an ecologically sustainable society. This is insufficient, to say the least. It is, however, understandable. The Marxist view of nature is sharply contested. Over the next few minutes, we'll take a look at the contest between first and second wave eco-socialists over Marx's own view of nature as a window into this contest. We urge you to take this conversation forward yourselves, and we've included materials to aid with an initial group discussion on the subject in the video description. Welcome to Approaching Marxism. Though ecological critiques have been interwoven into Marx's thought since its foundation, eco-socialism only came to form as a distinct tendency toward the end of the 20th century, in the late 1980s and 1990s. Its first wave arose out of the new left Marxist tendencies attempt to engage with the rise of modern environmentalist movements in the West from the 1960s. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this led to an approach which John Bellamy Foster a core theorist of the second wave, has described as grafting Marxian concepts onto already existing green theory, or, in some cases, grafting green theory onto Marxism. Whilst thinkers within this milieu produced useful work, for example Ted Benton's work on Malthusianism, Aaron Gare's Recovery of Early Soviet Ecology, or James O'Connor's 1998 essay collection, Natural Causes, the tendency put forward a reading of Marx's view of nature derived from green theory. Despite recognising that Marx makes a number of prescient observations on natural phenomena, first wave eco-socialism holds, in general, that he does not have anything serious to say in a systematic sense on these subjects, or even that he treats nature as a static and irrelevant object. This view takes many forms, but as Paul Burkett, another key theorist of the second wave, sets out in his 1999 work, Marx and Nature, it rests upon three core contentions. Firstly, Marx had a Promethean view of technology. That is, he viewed technological development as a progressive and linear process, situating capitalist development of industry as progressive, aside from it being privately owned, and communism simply as collective ownership and development of these same forces of production. Secondly, Marx excludes or downgrades the role of nature in production, particularly in his labour theory of value. Thirdly and finally, Marx's critique of capitalism has nothing to do with nature or the natural conditions of production. Each of these positions derive from misinterpretations of Marx's view of both nature and capitalism. Michael Lowey provides the clearest articulation of the first wave's charges of Promethean thought against Marx in his 1997 article For a Critical Marxism, where he states that Marx has a tendency to consider the development of the forces of production as the principal vector of progress, to adopt a fairly uncritical attitude toward industrial civilization, particularly its destructive relationship to nature. There is a reasonable basis to argue this position within Marx's writing, with the view that revolutions are driven by relations of production holding back the means of production 
in the preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy, the praise for the productive forces unlocked by capitalism in the Communist Manifesto, or his statement that steam engines produced society with the industrial capitalist in the poverty of philosophy, perhaps suggesting such a reading. However, this is a narrow textual basis. If the young Marx appears to hold a Promethean view of technology's development, the majority of his mature writing does not. For example, in the first volume of Capital, Marx describes machinery as the material embodiment of capital, an instrument of production which strikes down the worker, and the most powerful weapon against strikes. This analysis points toward a constructivist view of technology as an embodiment of social relations, and can hardly suggest an uncritical attitude to industry, or that the development of productive forces is a vector of progress in any absolute sense. Rather, it situates technological development as a site of struggle. Further, the combination of Marx's view that technology discloses man's mode of dealing with nature, his writing on capitalist agriculture's inherently destructive relationship to the soil, and his insistence that communist association will re-establish the most intimate ties of man with the earth, since the earth ceases to be an object of huckstering, seem to make any suggestion that he would view the destruction of nature as compatible with communism, somewhat laughable. After setting out these criticisms and others of the first wave's charges of Prometheanism, Burkett's Marx and Nature and Bellamy Foster's Marx's Ecology set out a more palatable reading of his view of technology and progress. Both argue that what Marx truly saw as progressive within capitalism's development of the productive forces was the development of science and social goods like education it opened up, and with this, the new potentials for human development that could be seized by a proletarian revolution. Though the conscious application of science to production, a phenomenon Marx considers as having developed under capitalism, is further developed by industrial machinery, Marx also understands that this serves to separate intellectual and manual labour. This division, and the division between humanity and non-human nature, are developments his communism explicitly seeks to end. It is hard to square this with any interpretation of Marx as a Promethean proposing limitless development and industrial exploitation of the earth. The first wave of eco-socialism's view that Marx downplays the role of nature in production breaks down into two related concerns. The first is well expressed by Joel Covell in his 2002 book The Enemy of Nature. Conceding that Marx is not a Promethean, Covell argues that the real problem with his view of nature is that he treats it as inactive, aside from where humanity acts upon it a natural substratum, and nothing more. As Burkett shows through the first four chapters of Marx and Nature, this is absurd. Marx directly rejects it, arguing that nature's universal metabolic process, which produces all of the materials needed for human subsistence and production, exists independently of labour. This active process, of which humanity itself is a product and a part, is the basis of all wealth. Labour, which Cavell claims Marx presents as the only active part of nature, is itself 
and natural object, a process through which the worker opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces. The second concern of first-wave eco-socialism in relation to criticisms that Marx downplays the role of nature is more historically specific. As a variety of its theorists, for example, Enrique Leff, Geoffrey Carpenter and Robert Campbell have complained. Marx's labour theory of value argues that nature does not produce value, thus denigrating its importance. This utterly misunderstands Marx's critique of capitalism. Value is not identical to wealth. It is an historic social category. All commodities possess both a use value, what an object does, and an exchange value, how much it may be traded for in other commodities on the market. As these categories are incomparable, exchange value must be determined by something else. The only quantifiable thing which all commodities possess in common is that they are products of abstract, social, human labour. The value of a commodity is, thus, determined by the amount of socially averaged labour it takes to produce. In observing this, Marx is not suggesting nature plays no part in commodity production. Natural products must serve as bearers of value and inputs into production. Rather, he is arguing that the human labour contained in a commodity is the only way in which the market may judge it, excluding all other factors. As Bouquet stresses, charging Marx with denigrating nature for this observation amounts to blaming him for capitalism itself. This particular failure to understand Marx's critique of capital is not only a theoretical problem, it is politically dangerous. The suggestion that nature can produce value implying that reforms might address the crisis before us by acknowledging this. In its most fundamental form, capitalist political economy denies this recognition. The significance of the second wave's corrections to this problem does not, however, end here. It also forms the beginning of an answer to James O'Connor's argument that Marx's theory of capitalism cannot account for natural crises as it has nothing to do with the natural conditions of production. The full answer to O'Connor, however, is contained within Marx's theory of the metabolic rift. We will return to this in the next episode of this series. In a recent and somewhat despairing article, the English socialist Jonathan Neal makes an impassioned plea to the eco-socialist movement to prioritise the climate crisis above all else. Among the challenges he lays at eco-socialists' feet is a short segment imploring his readers to stop worrying about Marx, as the work done defending him against charges he neglected nature is not useful in building a movement to save the world. Whilst it is correct that understanding Marx's view of nature does not provide us a ready-made toolkit to approach the extinction crisis, Neil's readiness to jettison all but a formal nod to class struggle represents an even greater extreme than such slavish adherence to the master. The rest of his article advances a deeply reductionist approach to the climate crisis, arguing that eco-socialists ought to advance the measures contained in his 2021 book, Fight the Fire. This work offers a detailed overview of emissions and measures to cut them. It is a technical manual. Though Neil admits that there is presently no social basis which can carry this to victory in a short section on degrowth, he leaves us with no remedy. What we are left with is an insistence upon a fetish of technical processes which will, it is to be assumed, save the world. Though certainly not Promethean, Neil himself advocates for degrowth. The essential problems of this view are maintained. As with the explicitly Promethean eco-modernist tendency, 
the social question is left to the side, but for a concluding lament. Neil retreats from the integrated critique of nature and society offered by Marx and clarified by his defenders to an artificial separation which claims that social problems can be solved by already determined technical means, if only humanity would listen. This way lies defeatism. We hope this discussion has provided a window into the debate between the first and second waves of eco-socialism and its continued importance. Now, it's over to you. <laughs>